Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, this is the uh, Wednesday night. We're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians, which is what we've been doing on Sunday because I didn't prepare anything else for Wednesday night. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for this privilege and this opportunity to fellowship together in the study of your word. As we approach your word today, give us a, a heart to understand, a, a desire to know more and more of your gr amazing grace, your love and your concern for us. Filter out that which is not of you, sealing to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We've been studying together uh, 2 Corinthians, and in our last study together, we were in the 7th chapter, and we were somewhere around the 6th verse, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6. We looked in this epistle at the God of comfort, uh, how he's dealt with carnal believers at Corinth, uh, the faithfulness of his promises and the wonders of his grace. We were, we were told that we have a grand message, just a phenomenal message to declare, that a message that we don't need to couch in uh, terms of, uh, uh, of trickery, deceit. Uh, we don't need to use bait. We're simply called to proclaim what God has done, and we were told that what God, in fact, had been doing throughout the ages and what He had accomplished in Christ Jesus was the reconciliation of the world, that world religious system, not imputing men's trespasses unto them. We were then told that uh, we are called to declare this message of reconciliation, what God had accomplished, uh, a finished transaction in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I suggested to you folks that much of modern Christianity has departed, at least to, to some degree, from the finality and the certainty of that message. As... Uh, Attempts are, are constantly made to exalt the human will and the human flesh in participating somehow in that reconciliation. And its message in the main seems uh, to not be to declare the truth of the reconciliation that God has accomplished, uh, this, uh, what He has accomplished in Christ Jesus but rather the potential of that truth. If the human is willing, and, and uh, we don't see any reference to human will uh, at all in the context, or in Scripture, for that matter. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Beginning in the sixth chapter, we were told not to take this lightly, not to take this concept casually, uh, not to receive His grace in vain. We're looking at the grace of God, and I believe in chapters 6 and 7, there is a, a subtle reference by the Holy Spirit, and maybe, maybe by subtle, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I mean a, a blow on the head with a two-by-four. I mean, I'm not sure, but there is, a, there is at least a subtle indication of the Holy Spirit that we need to get our priorities straight. It is so easy for us to take that casually and just concentrate on the physical. Much of modern enthusiasm in Christianity today is centered in experience, uh, some kind of cloud nine experience where that our concentration all seems to be in, this, uh, in the domain in, wherein we exist this temporal place and this temporal body, not in the concept of glory. 
Let's don't take this lightly, for it was, it, it was, in fact, God's central purpose and theme to reconcile us through Jesus Christ. This, is, this is, was God's program of the ages for the church. We looked at our attitude toward the Word of God, uh, our fellowship with God, and our fellowship with one another in the sixth chapter. We were told that we are primarily separated people because God separated us. We were taken back through a, a, a flurry of Old Testament quotations and concepts to point out that God in His divine grace moved not when Abraham asked him to move, but when God decided to move. Not when Israel longed for deliverance, but when God decided to deliver. We are separated people because God separated us. He separated us unto Himself. The vital truth of that is, is stated simply that it's because we are His people and He's our God. We were then told that if we were to enter into fellowship and communion with Him on the basis of this finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that concept can be narrowed down to Him being our Father and we being His children, sons and daughters. And we looked as we closed out the, the sixth chapter at the, the difference that fellowship and communion, walking in the light of the Word of God and in the will of God, uh, what that makes, the difference it makes in the life of the Christian, in the Christian's life, the reconciliation, the being His people and He being our God. And it, which is based absolutely and entirely upon what Christ has done. You know, whether we fellowship and commune with Him as Father and Son is, is based at least to some degree upon our yieldness, our willingness, and our surrender. Yet, I also suggest, I, I will suggest to you, that that, that also comes by grace. In the seventh chapter, I pointed out the, the uh, first verse is really a proper close of the sixth. Uh, there are no chapter divisions. Uh, we are reminded again that we possess some commitments, some contracts from God. They're called, they're called promises in the authorized version, but the word is, is really stronger than that. Uh, having this contract with God, this agreement with God, so we should then cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the deep reverence of God, fear of God, the deep reverence of God. And that is not law. It's not law keeping. In the fifth verse of chapter 7, Paul declares through the leading of the Spirit that their flesh had no rest. In the second chapter, he said, he had no rest in his spirit. In, in the second chapter, the Holy Spirit was driving him someplace else. Uh, in the seventh chapter is where the Holy Spirit wants him to be, but his physical experiences are not what he thinks that they ought to be. And as we began the seventh chapter, to me, it a very beautiful glimpse of the fellowship of the of the believer and the Holy Spirit in our daily walk and, and in our daily experience and in our service for Christ. Uh, first of all, we have our we have already seen that there is here an unannounced but very obvious concern for the welfare of believers uh, there at Corinth. Paul and his associates, the Holy Spirit admits we're having an effective operation, evangelistic campaign, if you will, in Troas. It was an operation that seemed clearly to be blessed by God. There, there were many things happening 
with positive results. Uh, they had a door open to them, but they didn't have any rest in their spirit. Everything that, that they could look at seemed to indicate that this is where the Lord wanted them to be. You know, we had an effectual door open in Troas. Apparently, the Holy Spirit was working, yet, yet they depart from Troas to, uh, for Macedonia. So I seem to get the message that what I may see on the outside is not necessarily an indication that I'm where the Spirit intends me to be at that moment. What Paul could, could see would indicate that he ought to stay in Troas. What the Spirit wrought in his heart indicated that they ought to go into Macedonia. Now, when he gets into Macedonia... What he could see there would indicate that he was in the wrong place. You know, for, for now, his flesh had no rest. He was troubled. He had conflicts. There were fears and, and conflicts. Conflicts that I believe had, and I suggested to you folks, had to, more to do with ministry, theological conflict, primarily between law and grace. Because that's the major conflict, whether you like it or not. Within were fears uh, in the physical area in which he walked. I'm sure uh, the evidence would seem to suggest that he wasn't where the Holy Spirit wanted him to be. He ought to be back in Troas where everything was going just all hunky-dory, as we say in Oklahoma here. So it seems that consistently I'm being told by the Holy Spirit that what I experience and what I see is not a valid indicator as to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's the point I want you to see. You know, back in my early days as a Christian, I used to go around and I'd speak at various places and I'd always, I'd always ask the question, how do you know that you're redeemed? You know, we'd have these little, we'd move the chairs in a circle and we'd have a little soiree, you know, thing. And, and I'd get lots of answers. I think, the, I think only maybe twice out of, out of many hundreds of answers that I ever get anything that, that I thought was scriptural. I'd get answers like, well, uh, I know I'm redeemed because I accepted Christ or because I was baptized, because I go to church, because my parents said so, you know, and all kinds of answers like that. Dearly beloved, if the only way that you know you're redeemed is, is by what you can see and experience, I've got great news for you, okay? That's, that's going to change. It's going to change from an experience-based uh, sight walk to a walk of faith. I am redeemed because of what I can see Look, folks, in Colossians, I'm told that He has translated me from the power of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. How do I know that? Okay? How do I know that? Because I think clean thoughts all the time, because I live a clean life, a squeaky clean life, you know, because things are going all, just really well, and because I, I don't have any real problems in my life, and none of those things no, are true. I only know it. I only know it. Okay? I only know it because He said so. The only way I know it. It's the only way I know it. We don't walk by sight. That's what we were told in 1 Corinthians. If, if we looked at the Corinthians by sight, well, I mean, these people wouldn't be redeemed. We, we, we'd have scratched off Corinth as an as a ultra-liberal, uh, ultra ultra-modern uh, sect that's not... It's not orthodox, and it's undoubtedly it's, they're headed for hell. But the proclamation was made not in Ephesians, but in 1 Corinthians that we walk by faith, not by sight. These were the most carnal group of believers on the planet at that time. At least in my experience, most of the Christians I meet are trying to walk by sight, not by faith. And somehow they call it faith, but, but they're twisting and they're turning constantly blown about by every wind of doctrine. 
because what they're they're calling faith doesn't seem to jive with with what they feel or what they experience god says to the most carnal group of christians in the world don't take my grace lightly and you think we're under law as a rule of life folks he Dearly beloved, he did not say, don't take my law in vain. He didn't say that. Now, I recognize it's easy, you know, to sit here and declare, you know, that come what may, I'll, I'll, I'll trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, in him. I don't know that, folks. I, I know I want that. I know that as an individual, I have not been through anything at all like what Paul or, or many of his companions, you know, had been through. Nor through what many of my brothers and sisters are going through. Apparently, God doesn't consider me strong enough, you know, and or faithful enough for, for those kind of experiences. But I know I want to be able to say that I walk by faith and not by sight. It doesn't matter whether I'm sick or well, happy, sad, rich, poor, you know, smart, dumb, you know, ugly, handsome, doesn't matter, you know, doesn't matter whether things go right or wrong. My God is in control. He's separated me unto himself. He's working all things together for my good. And I want to walk with the realization that my citizenship is in heaven. That my hope is in glory. That my relationship is with Christ, not on what I see. And not on what I experience, or I might, might or might not experience. What we saw in Macedonia indicated we should have stayed in Troas. But we went to Macedonia. You know, God has a lot of names. He's got many great names. He's the God of comfort. We have a God of love, a God of comfort, a God of glory, a God of power, the majestic God of all creation. But oftentimes, folks, it doesn't appear that way. It just doesn't seem that way. And the message of this passage includes, without any doubt, our walk by faith. If we were doing it God's way, we wouldn't choose Jerusalem. Uh, I mean, you know, we'd choose Bermuda or the Virgin Islands or Monte Carlo or some other, you know, quaint Mediterranean, you know, retreat someplace or, or some impressive, bustling, busy place. But, but God chose Jerusalem. And he didn't choose a very big play, a very big land. I mean, you know, you, you have to get clearance. If you're a pilot, you got to get clearance from three other countries just to turn a jet around. I don't know how long it would take to walk from one end of Palestine to another. I know, I know it would take me a long time. Jesus never left the Palestine his whole life. And God didn't choose a very big land. But it was the land of His people. We don't live a life of physical victory, and yet that seems to be what's preached today. You know, you, you, got, you got problems in your business, uh, life, uh, I mean, hey, you know, just get right with the Lord, it'll all work out. You know, you'll be president of Manhattan Chase, Man, Chase Manhattan Bank or something. You know, and if he did it for me, he'll do it for you. He will sure do it for you. Somehow we want to tell the world that that if it, it it'll just get right with God, you know, every, it's going to be super. You know, your wife will come crawling back, con confessing all of her, you know, all of her sins and all of her problems were, you know, she made all the mistakes, and you know, you'll have this super marriage and everything will work out, you know. You just, just come back to Christ and, and He'll fix everything. And folks, that's just not true. It's not true. And the more that we stress the physical goodness of being in Christ, the less emphasis we put on the spiritual reality of it all. Our God is a God of comfort 
and He comforts those that are cast down. If you're not cast down, you can't be comforted. How, how do you comfort somebody who's, who's got no problems? You know, he's not even going to understand what you're talking about. And look at this comfort by the coming of Titus. This is amazing, folks. It really is. You know, I, I, I don't know. You know, maybe I'm seeing something in this passage that's not there, but, but from my personal experience over the years in talking to Christians, you know, God's comfort is, well, you know, you got a hundred thousand dollars, you know, or, or somebody sent you a million, or 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 you know, you got the, the the parking lot paved at your church, you know, you got a or you, you got a big radio tower put up, you know, so you can preach the gospel to millions of people. Not the coming of Titus. And once again I continue the, the same thought, the same you know, in the passage that there is a drive by the Holy Spirit to point out to me that what is supremely important with my God, what really touches the heart of my God is the consolation of His children and primarily their spiritual condition. I think we'd all be a mess if God gave us all a million dollars. I just do. Is Titus going to come back and talk about the big collections in Corinth? The, the super new building that they built? You know, no, it was just the presence of Titus. Isn't that amazing, folks? I, I can let my mind wander, and maybe I, I do that you know, kind of too much as I sit and try to study, but Paul probably didn't have the best clothes. He probably left a rather elegant lifestyle when he when he ceased to be a Pharisee of the Pharisees, probably a, a, a member of the Sanhedrin, if I, if I read Acts correctly, there must have been a hundred comforts that Paul had known as a normal way of living that, that he now misses. But none of those were mentioned. And I find him greatly comforted. In fact, overjoyed an outpouring, an avalanche of praise and glory to God because of the presence of Titus. And not by Titus' presence only. First of all, I have the, I have the indication that uh, there was the concern for Titus, not only by his presence, but by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. He told us about your earnest desire. That's the authorized version. Your yearning. Your yearning. I'm not, I'm not sure what the believers of Corinth might say, but, the, but the, the Holy Spirit says the thing that thrills Him, and again, I think we miss a tremendous message, folks, if we fail to realize that we're looking at the heart of God, not just the heart of Paul, and what caused the great outburst here is, first of all, their yearning, their mourning. It says in the authorized version. The only place I can find it in the New Testament, your, your lament, your zeal, your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoice the more. I don't think it'd be just plain foolish for me to suggest that, that the me doesn't mean Paul. I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. But I, I would ask you once again, dearly beloved, to at least grapple with the concept that here is a believer who shows concern for other believers and other believers have now shown concern for him. But please, please extend that to realize that here is the Holy Spirit who rejoices over a hard attitude in Christians who are not walking in the light of the Word. Who rejoices in a change in the, in the hard attitude of Christians who are not walking in the light of the truth of God's Word. 
That's, that's what rejoiced the heart of God as well as the heart of Paul. Verse 8, For though I made you sorry, you know, with a letter, I do not repent, and so forth. So I think we need to pause here and just think about a couple of concepts. First of all, there's a tremendous amount of writing and research, articles, commentaries, trying to establish what this letter is. You know, there are those who believe that the letter that he mentions there, the letter or the epistle is 1 Corinthians. There are others who say, no way, you know, there's, there's nothing strong enough in 1 Corinthians to have ever caused, caused all of this uh, kind of agitation at Corinth. So there must be another letter that we don't know about. You know, some other letter that used very strong language and it just agitated these Corinthians a whole lot. The third concept is, is that, well, yeah, uh, there probably is another letter and it is clearly referred to in chapter two, you know, where Paul indicates that he wrote to, to him uh, and he's, He's really not talking about 1 Corinthians. Uh, in, in chapter 2, he's talking about uh, 3 Corinthians or, or something. You know, now, now, I don't know that I have any solution for you folks. I, I don't know what camp you sit in. You either believe that the letter is 1 Corinthians or that the letter is a lost letter. It's, a, it's an epistle that we really don't have. Uh, one could suggest that the epistle isn't really important, and I, I guess, that, well, I guess that kind of leads to, to why, why then mention it at all. I'm gonna simply suggest to you that I believe that the epistle is 1 Corinthians. Now, what I believe ain't worth a hill of beans. I think most of you have realized by now that what I believe sometimes is very, very strange. And so all I want to do is kind of stir up your minds here, get you to think a little bit about this. I'm suggesting to you that I believe the epistle is 1 Corinthians. Now, you don't have to agree with that. Uh, secondly, I believe that the normal objection to that, which is based upon the fact that the language of, of 1 Corinthians is not uh, sufficiently strong to cause this kind of a reaction, well, I, I, you know, it depends on how you would define uh, certain things. I think the answer to that objection is simply that the language isn't strong. It's not at all like I would have written it. I mean, if I had been God, That's what I'd have done. Boy, I mean, I'd have used words so strong that YouTube would have had to censor it. If we suggest that 1 Corinthians is not a strong letter, first of all, well, I'm, 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 I'm suggesting to you that all of the Bible from that concept does not appear to be very strong. It's a very simple statement from the sovereign God containing what he wants us to know. I believe the purpose of 1 Corinthians was instruction. Secondly, I think that the normal objection to, you know, the, the strength of 1 Corinthians is based upon the fact that we don't recognize the spiritual emphasis of the epistle. You know, we're looking more at the physical, you know, emphasis. Now, I don't mean to suggest by that that, that what was going on in Corinth physically was of no concern to God or that what's happening in your life physically is of no concern to God. What I do strongly mean to suggest is that what was going on physically was devastating the, the spiritual. 
And I've always believed that theological error precedes moral error. And since we, in our normal course of study, do not put much emphasis on the spiritual, the, the epistle doesn't seem to be a very strong statement. You know, for example, you know, to me it's a devastating statement, utterly devastating to say, well, here's a man that has somebody's, you know, not his wife, his father's wife, you know, incest. You know, I would I'd have probably recommended that the guy's toes be cut off, he'd be hung upside down by his, you know, by those, what was left of his feet, and, and for 38 hours and then shot. Okay, that's strong language to me. That's 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 nothing like saying that we walk by faith, not by sight. If I pick that one sentence, that is a devastating sentence in the spiritual life of a Christian. That one sentence alone brings me up short. Do I really walk by faith? Folks, do we really walk by faith? I know that that's the truth, but is that is that truth my experience, or is my personal experience one of walking by sight? So I believe that the language is very strong from a spiritual standpoint. God is always concerned about my spiritual good, and if the physical causes some pain and and some anguish, that's that's good if it drives me to spiritual truth. So I believe it's a strong epistle. And now we're forced to look at the concept of repentance. First of all, in, in modern Christianity at least, there is, there is no redemption if one does not repent. And so repentance then becomes, first of all, the action of the individual as a prerequisite for redemption. You want to be saved, you got to, you got to repent. Secondly, that action is in fact sorrow for sin. Now, the two words in the English translation for repentance are both present here in the Greek. One of, one of these has absolutely nothing to do with sorrow. The other is a word for regret. For though I made you sorry, Okay, that is not the word for repentance. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not regret it. Dearly beloved, I think, as others have, I'm not alone here, I, th I think the greatest tragedy of modern Christianity is, is the translation of the word repentance. Only once in verses 8 and 9 is the real word for repentance used which is a change of mind. Not a change of behavior, but a change of mind. The theological concept of repentance as we use it evangelistically really has nothing to do with sorrow. It has everything to do with a change of mind. And I'm not sorry at all for that. I don't regret that at all. I do regret that it caused you anguish for an hour says God through Paul. That's what the 8th verse says. Not that you were made sorry, but, but that sorrow occasioned by the Spirit, the, the spiritual import of the epistle. I, I, use, I use the word spiritual in there because I believe that's what the passage is, is saying. Uh, physically, the epistle was not that strong, and that spiritual import led you to a change of mind. We're told in the first epistle, uh, they were living, God says that y'all are living like kings, but God has caused you to be the filth and the offscouring of the world system. The Lord Jesus Christ was despised and rejected. The true minister of the evangelistic message is despised and rejected. What the spiritual truth did to them, and and what and what and that and that hurt, it caused them to change their mind, and that's the word repentance in verse nine, and that change of mind is simply that it is a change of mind 
from the physical to the spiritual, from law to grace, from flesh to spirit. It, it, it is a 180 degree reversal in the normal experience of the Christian. For you were made sorry after a godly manner with fear and trembling. So I'm going to suggest to you folks that most biblical translations skirt the sovereignty of God because it causes so much conflict. You were made sorry according to God. I mean, we, we might as well translate it that way in order that you might receive damage by us and nothing. Absolutely no damage by God. So I'm going to close with, with this uh, suggestion here. And that is that if the believer is submitted to the Holy Spirit of God according to the truth of the Word of God, it will not lead to spiritual damage in the life of other Christians. God is the overriding power. God is the one who is controlling the message. God is the one, uh, well, and the, and the deliverance of, of that message. He's controlling the deliverance of it in order that there won't be any damage. The damage is doctrinal, theological, spiritual. And it is my constant prayer that God will forcibly strip away error. Not that I can be free from error, but to lead you into truth. That you will, that you will not be damaged doctrinally by what is taught from this chair. These are wonderful chapters we're going through in 2 Corinthians. We've seen God's love and God's faithfulness. So we've seen our, the need for our trust and dependence. Uh, unlike Israel in the wilderness, uh, we, we've been shown service, reverence for God, yoked together with God and, and with one another. You know, the effects of sorrow and repentance in the context of grace, the ministry of reconciliation led by the Holy Spirit, where we're yoked together with God and with one another. You know, trials, tribulations, the comfort of fellowship, joy, uh, godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. Grace believers, folks, are not going to repent from having repented, okay? Whereas the worldly sorrow of the Christian, which is law produces only death which is not a hell loss of fellowship okay and folks this is smack dab in the context of christians the church okay i believe i had a change of mind that i'll never change my mind about look i love you all i truly do until next time this is steve thanks for watching